I can't hear anything. Good morning, everybody. My name is Mark Shklov, and I am the host of Law Across the Sea. And aloha, welcome. Uh, today's show is an uh, interesting one. It's with an old friend of mine, uh, an immigration attorney, United States immigration attorney, uh, who lives right now in London. Uh, his name is Richard Goldstein. Uh, welcome, Richard. It's good, good to see you. Aloha, Mark, and thank you for inviting me. And, uh, you know, I said you were an immigration attorney. Well, um, what is an immigration attorney? Can you give us a little, a little hint or a little, a little bit of a description of what an immigration attorney does and what, a pra what your practice is like? Well, my practice is particularly international because we have an office in New York as well as in London. But the nature of our specific clients in both jurisdictions is both corporate and high-tech entrepreneurial people, as well as individual family work. My work in the London office is primarily consular work. I deal with a good deal of expatriation cases, people giving up American citizenship. But in general, we deal with all aspects of U.S. immigration and visa law. Now, what, what does that mean? That means pe people that want to come into the United States. Correct. For, for some reason, and they want to live here forever, or per, part, just part-time, or what, what type of folks are you talking about? Well, it's both kinds of folks. People who want to come to the United States on a permanent basis, where they need to acquire an immigrant visa. People who want to come temporarily, which are either people coming on visitors' visas, or people coming on temporary work permits. So we deal with both aspects of, of those kinds of individuals. And once again, we also deal with people who want to leave the United States. Okay, well, let's try to divide those a little bit uh, as we go forward. Now, you're, when you started practice of immigration law, how long ago was that? Um, I hasten to be resistant and reluctant to respond <clears throat> but it's almost 40 years ago. Okay, so, and that's why we titled our, our segment today, Around the World in 40 Years. I see. And, and, and so, uh, has, has, has the practice of immigration law changed much over those periods of time, or, or is, it, is it the same type of practice? It, it's, in some aspects, very similar to when I got started. In other aspects, it's quite different. Now, in particular, especially in view of the forthcoming election, um, it's a much more political kind of discussion going on in terms of who should be allowed in, who should be prevented from coming in, as I'm sure the viewers understand, without going into the politics of it. Um, when I first started as an immigration lawyer, it was much more focused on bringing people to the United States, either by family relationship or by job or by investment. Okay. And y you mentioned that... Uh a lot of your uh, practice deals also with uh, people that want to give up their citizenship. Mm. Now, now wh why would somebody want to give up their U.S. citizenship? The answer is very simple, tax. Um, that also, by the way, applies to people who are long-term permanent residents of the United States, who have green cards, who want to give up their permanent resident status, people who acquire citizenship, primarily people who are deemed to be what we call birth citizens. They acquired it at birth, because anyone born in the United States is constitutionally an American citizen, even if your parents were both illegal at the time you were born. Um, and there are people like that who left the United States early on, after their families left to return back to their home country, and never even realized they had American citizenship, and later on, when they want to go to the United States, they apply for a visitor's visa or a work visa, and they find out, well, you were born in the United States, sir or ma'am, you're already a citizen. You don't have to do that. And you don't, well, yes, you don't have to do that. You can either re-enter by applying for a passport, which most of them won't have if they left very early on in life, or alternatively, you can give up your citizenship, which we call expatriation. Okay. All right, uh, and I do want to go a, a li little bit more into that. You know, uh, you, you said taxes, but it seems to me somebody gives, gives up their U.S. citizenship, that's a pretty big step to me. Uh, it's all about money is what I hear. I would say 99 out of 100 cases where people are giving up their American citizenship or long-term permanent residence, no matter what the client tells you as the lawyer initially, 
you have to keep questioning, questioning, questioning as to their real motivations. Usually we hear rather innocuous responses. I don't like the weather in America. Um, I don't like the American president. I don't like the social system there. The schools aren't great for my kid. But when you push, the ultimate answer, especially if we're talking people with high income, substantial assets, later on in life when they're starting to deal with viewing estate and tax issues, mm -hmm. um, they start thinking of whether or not it makes sense to maintain their citizenship. Okay. Now, most people think of immigration as to what we talked a little bit about was folks coming into the United States for various reasons. And now I, I, I want to go one more step. What is the process uh, when you give up your citizenship? What, right. what is that type of a process? That, because that's, that, that'll be something new for, for most folks. Sure. Well, the first thing to point out is that whenever we see a client, and I'm sure this is the same for most of my colleagues who deal with this work, the first and most appropriate thing to do always is to find out whether or not they have received appropriate tax advice on the consequences of expatriation because it is quite feasible and quite likely that if they're high income, high asset, at the time of expatriation, they may be subject to what we call an exit tax, which can be very innocuous and very expensive, and only the really very wealthy ones may determine that it still pays to go ahead and do this, because contrary to what a lot of people think, Mark, a permanent resident, like an American citizen, is required to file a U.S. tax return every year on worldwide income. And there are many, many permanent residents, as well as Americans born in the U.S. who left the U.S. for a variety of reasons, living in Asia, living in Europe or elsewhere, um, who never assume that even though they're receiving income for their work overseas, they're still required to file a U.S. tax return on worldwide income. So they need to get proper tax advice. Okay. And in a no double taxation jurisdiction, like most of the major countries in the world, if they've paid a substantial amount and sufficient amount of taxes to their country of residence and presumably nationality other than the U.S., they will probably not be subject to a double tax in the U.S. But that does not relieve them of the responsibility to file a U.S. tax return verifying that. And I myself, like my wife and my son, we're dual nationals. We live both in the U.S. and the U.K., primarily in the U.K. now. I travel back and forth, as you know, um, and we do have to report our U.K. taxes and U.K. income on our U.S. consolidated return. Okay, but, all right, so you, you, you say, what type of tax advice? Why do, you, why do you want to leave the United States? Have you got tax advice? Then what is the next step for somebody that is contemplating or just want, wants to, sure. to give up their citizenship. If they're confident that this is what they want to do and they've gotten tax advice and they found out about the consequences and the amount of presumably the exit tax, which may not necessarily be offensive to the very wealthy or it may not be offensive at all. Uh, how much is that? I mean, is there a way it, to... It will totally depend on their assets on the date of expatriation. And what is an exit tax? It's a tax that the U.S. imposes on people who want to give up their citizenship or permanent residence. When they leave? When they leave. I the see. idea is to discourage them from doing so or to verify that they're up to date on their taxes. I see. So if the client comes to me and says, well, I've got my tax advice, I want to go. I want to leave the U.S. I'm taking my family with me we would then explain to them the procedure. The first and most important thing to explain to them is they have to deal with the expatriation at an American embassy or a consular post. They cannot do this in the United States while they're physically there unless we're in a period of declared war, which has not happened since the end of the Second World War. So the Vietnamese War, the Korean War, would not be deemed to be a place or an occurrence where one could expatriate physically in the U.S. So we then determine where is the most appropriate place for them to expatriate. Would it normally be in the country that they want to go to, or is it? It's usually in the country of their alternate nationality, which raises a very interesting point, Mark. We've talked about this earlier. If from a technical point of view, you do not have to have an alternate nationality to give up your American citizenship. Consular offices who will interview the person for the formal expatriation process will usually require showing evidence of the alternate nationality. If they don't do that and the expatriation becomes finalized, which is a procedure we can talk about if you wish, 
then technically the person has given up their American citizenship, they've given up their passport. Once they walk out of the embassy, they're stateless. Now, the next question for them to deal with is, well, what do I do if I'm in the UK or if I'm in France or I'm in Germany or I'm in Japan and Korea and I've given up my citizenship, I've left the embassy, I'm stateless. From a legal point of view under the local jurisdiction's laws, they're probably going to be out of status and illegal. How are they going to get out of the country? And where you need a go? passport to leave. <laughs> well, the U.S. does have a treaty with most countries which verifies that they can be, if they're an American citizen giving up their citizenship without an alternate nationality, the U.S. will parole them back in, readmit them back in. What happens then is questionable. Well, we don't have great numbers of these people. Okay. And very few in far and, between. But, and most of them would be dual citizens yeah. and they would already have that arranged before they decide That's to correct. give up. That's correct. And uh, I, I think I've asked you this uh, before in various times, but where, where do these folks go? Where they give up their citizen? Is there a, a favored country or is there a favorite jurisdiction? I, I mean, I, I want to give up my citizenship of the United States where I, I've lived and I want to for tax reasons, and I want to go somewhere else. Where do, where, where do they go? They, they go everywhere, Mark. Yeah. Usually they go to the country that they've been living in most of the time since they left the U.S. because they already have a, a social system created there. Their social status is already established there. Their center of gravity politically, economically, socially is there. So, for example, if I wanted to give up my American citizenship, which I have no plans on doing, or my wife Julie or my son Daniel wanted to do it, and we wouldn't. We have no plans to ever do it. But since we've lived in the UK most of our time, and we have UK passports, we would presumably want to go to the UK, deal with the expatriation there, and we have a UK passport to stay there, which at least for the next two years enables us to travel around the EU. Okay, we'll get into that in the next part of this. But now, you know, you talked about quite a little bit now about you, and I mentioned earlier that you, you live in London, but I know that you're a nice boy from New York. So how did that ever happen? How did a, a nice boy from, from New York get to London, and why? What was that about? First of all, it's a long time since anyone called me a nice boy, <laughs> <laughs> so thank you. Uh, well, I've always had an international focus in my education, in my traveling pre-law school, um, and I always wanted to spend a considerable amount of time overseas. But when I got admitted to the bar, um, I thought that it made good sense to go to a place where, first of all, I could understand the language, because I was not a great linguist, and still am not a great linguist. Um, so having been to the UK um, as a college student, it seemed to make sense if I'm establishing an international immigration practice maintain the office in the United States in New York and start spending a considerable amount of time in the UK where I felt physically, socially, and politically comfortable, where I thought it was easy to meet people and develop relationships. And actually, I was one of two of the first two immigration lawyers, US immigration lawyers, to actually open an office in the UK. Um, and when, now, when, when was this, by the way? 1979. OK, and how long had you been a lawyer at that time? I'd been a lawyer since 1976. So a rather quick move. And you've always been in immigration. Always, always oh. been in love with U.S. immigration law. I, I found it to be an extraordinarily rewarding profession. Um, I've always enjoyed dealing with people from all over the world. Um, we, we've had some wonderful clients over the years. Um, and it's really been a pleasure to help bring good people to the United States. Okay. And we're going to talk a little bit more about bringing good people into the United States and also whether we should be keeping people out in a few minutes after we take this break. Hey, everybody. My name is David Chang, and I'm the new host of a new show, The Art of Thinking Smart. I'm really excited to be able to share with you secrets on giving yourself the smart edge in life. We're going to have awesome guests and great mentors of mine from the political, military, business, nonprofit, you name it. So it's something for everybody. Aloha, my name is Danelia, D-A-N-E-L-I-A. -E and I'm the other half of the duo, John Newman. 
We are the co-hosts of Keys to Success, which is live on ThinkTech live streaming network series weekly on Thursdays at 11 a.m. Aloha. Aloha. Welcome to ThinkTechHawaii.com. This is Johnson Choi, your host. My focus is Asia in Reveal. We talk about interesting subjects in Asia. Be sure to check the ThinkTech.com website on the next topic. Thank you. Aloha, I'm Chantel Seville, host of the Savvy Chick Show on Think Tech Hawaii. This show is for you. It's all about inspiring and empowering girls of the future to do what they love, get out there and be healthy, fit and confident. If you're up for that, 11 a.m. every Wednesday, I'll see you there. Hi, I'm Stephen Philip Katz. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist here in Hawaii and I'm the host of Shrink Wrap Hawaii, which is on Tuesdays at 3 o'clock. Have a great summit. Take care of your mental health. Aloha, everyone. I'm Maria Mera, and I'm here to invite you to my bilingual show, Viva Hawaii on ThinTech Hawaii, every other Monday at 3 p.m. We are here to talk about news, issues, and events local and around the world. Join me. Aloha. Aloha! How you doing there, lassies and laddies? This is Angus McTech here on ThinkTech Hawaii, and I have my favorite show, Hibachi Talk, with my good old buddies, Gordo the Texara and Andrew the Security Guy. Please join us every Monday. No, it's Friday. Every Friday from 1 p.m. to 1.30 p.m. here on ThinkTech Hawaii, and you can also find us on YouTube, Hibachi Talk. Aloha! All right, folks, we are back. Uh to Law Across the Sea, Around the World in 40 Years, with Richard Goldstein. Richard, we were talking about an, a, a concept that most people don't think of in immigration law, that is U.S. citizens that want to leave the United States. Now I want to come back and talk about bringing people in and you you mentioned you you know you like the idea of bringing good people into the the United States who who are those good people what types of folks bring, that you help come into the United States what, why are they coming in I want to ask that then I also want to ask about do we keep people out and what type of folks do we keep out and what that has to do with this election that's ha happening right now but first what type of what type of people do you help come into the United States normally well, that depends on one's immigration law practice. There's a whole variety of aspects of U.S. immigration law that people tend to specialize in. We do not in our law firm, for example, deal with people who are subject to deportation or removal from the United States. We do not deal with litigation. Um, that doesn't mean that that's not important. It's just that we don't specialize in those areas. We have many colleagues who do, and they do an outstanding job representing individuals. The nature of our firm's work is primarily business-oriented immigration law, okay. which means getting people either temporary work visas or eventually getting them permanent resident status in the U.S. It includes high-tech people, people in the medical and scientific professions, um, people who are teachers, students as well who are going to university in the United States, um, as well as a whole variety of other people, including entrepreneurs who wish to make investments in the United States. So that's really the nature of our firm's practice, certainly in New York. In the London office, we also deal with people who have been um, denied temporary visas for a whole variety of reasons. Either they have committed some offense in the past some criminal offense which requires for the most part a waiver of ineligibility or they have had some political issues and the problems in the past which raise issue as to their eligibility for admission. Um, there is a whole variety of about 38 grounds of ineligibility to enter the U.S. but none of them have raised the current issue of whether or not people should be religiously precluded from coming to the United States. Okay, so before we get there, so the people that you're helping are mostly in business. Correct. They're, they're, and they're providing an economic benefit. Although Correct. Although you also have students. Correct. And uh, the people that are coming in are temporary in the United States. For the most part. For the most part. So are the students. Uh, 
let me ask you, why should they be temporary? Do we want these people to come in and stay? Uh, or do they have to turn around and leave after some period of time? Is that, is that a good, good policy? Well, that's for the, at the beginning really a decision for the individual to make. There are many young people who come here to, to the U.S. to attend American universities who have the desire to leave at the end of their studies and return home mm -hmm. for family reasons, for business reasons. The United States is no longer the only country where people can succeed business-wise. There are many countries, as you know, which are economically very sustainable, very successful, and people often want to come to the U.S. just to get a good education. Where it becomes a dramatic problem is where we have put foreign students through the American university system. And at the end of that, we give them the option of what we call optional practical training. But then we make it increasingly more difficult for them to be able to remain in the United States and get a proper work visa to remain. Our temporary work visa system is at the very center of gravity um, economically concerned with the impact on the American Labor Union. It's a numerically limited, limited visa. So for example, the H-1 visa, which is a non-immigrant visa, which most students, particularly those who are highly educated, high-tech people, entrepreneurial people, people who have ideas for incubator companies, after they finish their optional practical training, they often want to remain in the United States and they look to the H-1 visa, which is usually the appropriate visa. Regretfully and unfortunately, and due to the impact of the American labor unions, the U.S. has substantially restricted the numbers. And if you look to the major companies in the U.S. that are hiring high-tech people, they will tell you, it's absurd. We are telling the world's best, brightest students, sorry, we have enough bright, best students here. We don't need you any longer. So go. We're telling companies like Microsoft, go build a factory in Canada. Which they did. Which they did. We're telling companies like Apple, Intel, you know, you can't get your work visas for engineers in suitable numbers for those you want. So as a result, go open factories overseas and hire them there. Mm -hmm. It really is absurd when our numbers are so restrictive on H-1 visas that we're telling half the people, in some cases, two-thirds of the people who are being applied for by companies who have real jobs, who've passed through the labor department system so that we know they're economically qualified, they're going to be paid a proper wage, they're educationally qualified, but we tell two-thirds of them, sorry, we have no more numbers for you, um, so leave. And that, to me, is an absurdity. Okay, so, and that's why I asked you the question. It's because I, I thought that might be your answer. Because here you have these, these great young kids that we, that we train and then we, we send away. And with respect to somebody that comes in on a business visa, not, not a student, how, how does that apply? Is, is the same, same rule they can stay for a while, then they have to leave? Well, it depends on the <coughs> visa they come in. I see. Uh, it depends on the temporary visa. Most of our visas will permit anywhere from four to six years, with the exception, really, of the E-2 Treaty Investor Visa. So if, for example, let's say you were coming from the UK, Mark, you were born in the UK, you had a UK passport, and you said to me, Richard, I'd like to open a business in the US, how do I get a visa? I would say to you, well, tell me the nature of the business that you want to invest in and what your investment funds look like in terms of numbers. And if you have a substantial amount of money, and I know you're going to say, well, what's a substantial amount of money? Fortunately, the system doesn't define substantial. They will look to the nature of the business and determine if the amount is substantial. So the amount of money you would need to open a, uh, a fish and chip shop in Manhattan, as opposed to a car factory in Detroit, is substantially different. But as a general rule, setting up a new business, a small business, if someone is able to invest several hundred thousand dollars um, and they are going to be the primary investor in the business, they are going to be able to qualify as a general rule for the E-2 Treaty Investor Visa, which will generally be issued on a five-year period of time and is renewable indefinitely okay. until the business closes. Great. Can any of these people become U.S. citizens? Well, that's a good question. You have to look at the individual's background to determine eligibility for permanent residence first. You go from a non-immigrant visa or a work visa 
to a green card, which is permanent resident status. After you've acquired the permanent resident status, unless it was based on marriage to an American citizen, you need to wait five years in order to then apply for citizenship, providing you've had a sufficient amount of time physically resident in the U.S., no criminal convictions, um, no issues with arrests of any consequence, you should be able to acquire citizenship. So you don't go from temporary visa to citizenship. In between, you have to get the green card. So there is a pathway. There is a pathway. Okay. Although it sounds like it's a little bit long and uh, you have to follow some rules, which is fair, and, but you could get there. And it's worth pointing out that that's the same in most countries in the world. The U.S. is not mm -hmm. unusual okay. or unique. Okay. And, you, and you, you help folks with doing that? Myself and all my colleagues around the United States who do U.S. immigration work. Okay. Now I want to talk about something that is uh, perhaps uh, in political nature in a way, but I, and I don't want to get too deep into who's saying what, but how do, you know, it, there's been talk about keeping certain types of folks out of the United States based on religion or race, uh, where you come from. What's that about, and, and is, it, is it really something that's possible with immigration law to, to keep uh, somebody out because of their religion or because of their race, or uh, is, is it just political talk? What, what's going on here? Well, now we're getting political, Mark. Yes, yes, I'm um, sorry. And I, you, know, you know my feeling on it. Um, I think if any effort were made to preclude Muslims from coming to the United States, and remember we have 11 million Muslims who are American citizens, so when a presidential candidate says, we're gonna stop Muslims from coming, um, what are we gonna do with the 11 million Muslims who are in the US who are American citizens? Um, are you going to deport American citizens? Um, I would not think you'd be constitutionally or legally able to do that. Are you going to be able to change our immigration rules to say, if you are a Muslim or some other religious, of some other religious background, you're not eligible to acquire a visa to come to the US? either on a temporary or permanent basis. Uh, I abhor that kind of subjection, so there, suggestion. There, there, that's not, what I hear you saying is that's not a, not a reasonable proposal. Well, it's totally illegal, unconstitutional in my view, to be rather strong and firm <laughs> on it. So okay. I think you know where I stand on that issue. Okay, and, and uh, how about trying to keep other people out of the United States by, uh, building a wall or, or somehow putting some other uh, barrier. Is that, uh, is that also a possibility or? Uh, well, let me first point out that our current problem with illegal aliens has very little to do now as it may have had to do 30 or 40 years ago with the Mexican-US border. 45% of people who overstay in the United States, which means they've overstayed their visa status, which means they're illegal almost half of them came on proper U.S. visas and just stayed. Um, and the fact that we are thinking of, or it's being suggested that we should put up this huge wall, uh, to me is absurd. Um, and the basic reason for that is we have a huge Canadian border. And who are we really afraid of? Are we afraid of Mexican workers who are coming to work in our farms, to mow our lawns, to cook in our restaurants? Or should we really be focused on terrorists? Right. And you'll have to come back another time to discuss that because we are at the close of our program today and i want to thank you very much my dear friend for being with me today on law across the sea thank you mark it's been a pleasure and thank all of you who watched